So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Brooks Roach. I am a diabetes education specialist with Diabetes Canada. My pronouns are he and him, and I would like to begin by acknowledging that I'm joining this webinar from the traditional and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. So wherever you are joining or watching from, I'd like to invite you to express gratitude for the land on which we live and acknowledge all the past inhabitants of the indigenous lands we now call Canada. I am super excited to be here today to talk with a few experts about the connections between type one diabetes, virtual care and the COVID-19 pandemic. We are going to discuss among other things, how those of us with type one diabetes have been impacted uh, and the challenges and opportunities posed by virtual care, both now and in the future. We have the great pleasure of being joined today by three guests. Uh, first, Dr. Ilana Halperin, who is an endocrinologist and assistant professor at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center uh, and the University of Toronto Department of Medicine's Division of Endocrinology and Metabolism. Karen Cox, who is a nurse practitioner who lives with type 1 diabetes. And we have Mark Buckle, who is a passionate advocate for access to type 1 technologies uh, and who also lives with the disease. So uh, sincere welcome and thank you to you all for being here. For having us. They are uh, our experts will be answering some key questions uh, that Diabetes Canada has been hearing from our community and that our experts have been hearing and experiencing from their patients and from life with type 1 diabetes over the past year and a half, roughly. Uh, we'll also be taking questions from our viewers. So some questions have already been submitted and you can ask yours by replying in the comments below. I'd like to get started uh, by passing a question to Dr. Halperin. So, I'm wondering if you can walk us through the impact that the COVID-19 pandemic has had on people with type 1 diabetes. Uh, for sure. So I think I would start by talking about the impact that COVID-19 has had on everyone. And um, I often talk about how living life with type 1 diabetes and anything else you're trying to do, whether it's go to school, be pregnant, um, have a full-time job, is just that much harder because living with diabetes is a full-time job. And of course, the stress and the isolation that everyone has experienced over the last 16, 17 months is going to be that much more magnified, especially for people who might be struggling with access to medications and access to face-to-face -face care for acute complications of diabetes. And I know we'll speak about that a little bit more um, later on, but I think certainly uh, this has been a challenging time for people living with diabetes um, due to concerns about getting sicker from COVID and just in general being um, isolated from their support people, friends and family, et cetera. I have noticed that some of my patients, however, have done well in the pandemic because working from home and having a little bit more control over their routine has actually made their diabetes management a little bit more predictable. For some, less physical activity has been frustrating, but others have found like different and sort of unique ways of incorporating predictable exercise into their work from home routine. And certainly I've had patients tell me that being able to control their diet um, has been much more helpful than what would they were necessarily eating when they were not working from home. So certainly that has been the case for everyone, but some people have actually done better in the pandemic. Um, and one thing we've definitely learned that we'll speak to more throughout the, the next hour is how well diabetes is suited to virtual care. And I believe that in the future, I will be continuing a sort of a hybrid model with my patients living with diabetes, where I would definitely like to see them in the office at least once a year for a physical examination, a foot check, blood pressure, a weight check, et cetera. Um, but especially with well-connected digital platforms, uh, we can stay connected and offer good quality care um, even when we're not face-to-face. It's really helpful, um, Elena, and I want to thank you for that, and I want to kind of connect a few dots on this next question, which is directed to Karen and Mark. And we've heard now the, the sort of clinical approach to, to what's happened, and I'm wondering if you two can share a bit of both. So what's it been like at the individual level to both live with type 1 diabetes and to treat it? So in, in Karen's case, you're doing a bit of both, and, and Mark, as someone that's that's living with uh, with type one and trying to navigate all the other challenges of, that life has brought forward. Uh, what's that been like over the course of this pandemic? Yeah, Karen, if you want to start. Uh, sure, yeah. Um, so I would say that it's been it's been challenging, but I feel like over the last year I have. Um, kind of learned how in a lot of ways to manage this chronic condition 
better in this sense. Um, so like Alana was saying, like definitely physical activity has become really like a key aspect of my day-to-day -day life and diabetes management. Um, I have three young children and there is not a lot to do with them when there is nothing open and we have no family to be with. And so getting outdoors and being physically active with them has had a huge positive impact on my diabetes because I'm finding that I've learned so much with the technology available and just about insulin sensitivity and the, the benefits of cardiovascular exercise on, um, on my health and my overall well-being. And it, it helps me to, I think, be a better diabetic. And I think it helps me to be a better mother when I'm exercising and just feeling mentally and physically fit. Um, but I would say that the pandemic has had its challenges too. I miss in-person care. Um, as a patient, I miss being seen by my endocrinologist. Um, I like I like that that human interaction and I like being seen in person. And even though you know diabetes is 24-7 chronic disease and even though it's on us to, to manage this condition every day for the rest of our lives. Um, there's something nice about having that relationship and rapport with an endocrinologist who can like help you navigate those like treacherous waters when you're needing help adjusting a basal insulin or adjusting your boluses or whatever else and having somebody look objectively at that and, and to see you in person and to check your blood pressure and to look at your feet and to check your weight and just to check in and see like, how are you doing? Like, you know, it's hard having diabetes, like just to have that like one-on-one -on -one in person discussion. So for those reasons during the pandemic, I have, I've struggled a little bit because I, I like having in-person care. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Karen. I, I can definitely relate to a lot of the points you made there. Um, just like lifestyle in general got a lot easier, um, more predictable kind of as Alana mentioned as well. Um, and I guess on the other side of it, there was a, a bit of an unexpected thing that the pandemic brought for me. So um, pre-pandemic, I was using a continuous glucose monitor, uh, primarily on and off, but mostly on for the last five years. Um, I was also looping for about two years of it. And I was fortunate to do all that because I had a job that provided really good benefits and full coverage for advanced glucose monitors. Um, so FGMs and CGMs. Um, but then the pandemic happened and I was laid off, um, like a lot of people were. And, uh, so it was a good amount of time without work. And I kind of got to a point where I had to cut back some of my diabetes budget. Um, it was kind of the first time I ever kind of faced this in my over 24 years of living with it. Um, so I went back to the basics. Um, I went to finger pricking and MDI again, and I know a lot of people um, still treat like that and they use that as their their go-to management source but kind of after being on a pump for about 17 years and again uh, CGM for five and uh, hybrid closed loop for two um, as I mentioned to Alana Brooks last week, last week it was kind of like going back to the land before time with diabetes edition um, so uh, yeah it was uh, it was a little tough to get used to that after kind of having this really good source of management um, but it really opened my eyes, um, that, you know, how just beneficial living with these technologies can be and how getting in a crunch where you don't have access to it is, uh, is, does take a toll. You know, it's a, I'd be lying if I said it wasn't a little bit of a struggle on the mental health side of things, because, you know, going from a CGM with 288 readings a day, uh, back to, you know, on average 10 readings a day with finger pricks, um, it's a bit frustrating when you have those days where, um, you know, your blood sugars are high and you just didn't expect it. You didn't see it going there. Uh, so that, that side of the, the pandemic was, was a bit tough. Um, but it was also very eye opening. Um, wasn't all bad. Um, uh, but it, uh, it definitely, you know, opened my eyes to the importance and just how, uh, well I had it with, with all the technologies. Um, luckily I got a job again and, and all that's, that's good. But, uh, yeah, it was, it was definitely a bit of a struggle there for a bit um, because of uh, good old COVID. Thanks, thanks for sharing that, uh, Karen and, and Mark. I mean, I really appreciate the, this notion of, I believe it was the, the great philosopher John Mayer who said, you don't, you don't know what you got till it's gone. It's, it's sort of the case of that. It's some of the, the incredible benefits that come from using this technology get so integrated into daily life. That's what they're, they're for. And when 
you know, I personally haven't had to make one of those uh, removals of a certain treatment, whether it's a pump or a CGM, but I can imagine that's, that's such a difficult transition, almost a, feels like a step backward. Um, so, so really thanks for sharing. And I'm sure there's a lot of folks out there that can relate to that challenge. On the note of these, these sort of changes and, and changes potentially for the, for the worse or the challenges that have been posed by the pandemic, I'm wondering, uh, Elena and Karen, if you can comment on what changes or whether you've noticed changes in the prevalence or severity of type one and, and new diagnoses during the pandemic. I'll let Elena take this one just because I don't typically see new type ones in my practice. So, yeah, so I think, um, like anecdotally, I early on I saw quite, quite a, it seemed like I was seeing more new patients, but in the literature, what it seems like for sure is that we're seeing people presenting later. So whether there's truly an increase in autoimmune disease in the context of the pandemic is, remains to be seen. Um, but certainly people have been afraid to seek medical care for what they would consider to be mild symptoms. And so there's definitely been some literature, especially in the pediatric space, about more children presenting with DKA. So the milder symptoms of presentation, like feeling thirsty, peeing a lot, losing some weight might be sort of brushed aside because nobody wants to seek acute medical care. They're afraid to get COVID in an emergency department. And so when people do present um, with a new diagnosis of type one, they seem to be sicker. And I think that's just an important message to leave people with. I mean, I really hope the worst is behind us now with the pandemic uh, with very high rates of vaccination, but we, can, we, we have seen that the excess mortality in the last year has not just been related to people dying from COVID. It's been related to people dying from cardiac disease, presenting with cancers that are more advanced. Um, and this is a real, a real fallout of the pandemic for fear of seeking medical care face to face. Um, but it's been an important message, I think, for physicians across the country to let people know that doctor's offices are open. We do want to hear from you. And then if we need to see you in person, we will, you know, the, the fear of not having enough PPE, that was like a, that was a phase one or whatever, wave one problem. Um, but empty emergency departments don't usually bode well for long-term um, health. And so um, I think that's something to, to keep in mind for even for people living with diabetes, not to dismiss symptoms that you might be having, whether it's some chest pain, shortness of breath, something funny growing on the bottom of your foot. These are things that should not be ignored just because of the pandemic. Karen, I wonder if you could share some of your uh, experience from the past past year on severity and, and sort of the way that you've engaged with with type ones uh, throughout the system. Karen, one yeah, thing so I think you you mentioned when we were on another talk that I think would be helpful for you to talk about is your experience with people's mental health struggles in the pandemic. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think everybody is um, everyone's struggling, and and it has been like in such a such a hard year but for people with a chronic illness and for for those with diabetes it's been even harder it's hard to manage a chronic illness without a pandemic so when you add that on top of everything else it's a strain on your mental health so I would say that um in my practice I do typically see patients who um uh, I don't typically, see, I wouldn't typically see like a new diabetic, but I might see somebody with an established diagnosis of diabetes, um, longstanding diabetes, who's coming in complaining of something like fatigue or a low mood or, you know, kind of feeling hopeless, hopeless or worthless. And those kind of things are definitely more pronounced the last year with the pandemic because um, people are struggling. It's during the pandemic, it's, it's been hard to manage just, um, without a chronic illness. So when you add having to manage something 24 hours a day, it's just an added complexity and it's straining people's um, mental health. That's the bottom line. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for, for sharing that, Karen. It's a um, bit of an aside, but you know, there's so much difficulty and, and there's so much even diagnosable distress in the form of diabetes distress. It is a, it is a mental health condition and it's, uh, it's Prevalence is around 53%, according to uh, Dr. Michael Vallis out of Dalhousie and Halifax, uh, in the type 1 population. So this is a predisposition to depression, to anxiety, and as you mentioned, those feelings of hopelessness or worthlessness 
they they crop up quite naturally in this constant management of a, of a disease like type one that's so built on self management, so built on constant decision making, um, and it can be, be very easy to tie our worth to a number in the form of A1C or in the form of uh, you know how are we quantifying how well we're doing. Uh, it can feel very exhausting for people. For sure. So, and I would say to you, like, I, I say to my husband, like, I've got to get a run in. Like, I stay sane because I get a run in. I have to go for a run. <laughs> so, like, that is, my, that is my refuge. That is my, that is how I maintain a level of sanity. <laughs> go for a run. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, some of the, so many changes have occurred over the past year. And, um, Elena, I'm thinking about the significant change that many of our viewers have likely experienced firsthand and been interested in, and it is this transition into virtual care as a really predominant way of, of caring for type 1 diabetes. So um, can you explore kind of what this means and the different ways that we can provide or receive care virtually? Yeah, for sure. I think, um, you know, it, sometimes pandemics come in we're, we're, they're silver linings, I guess is what I was going to say. And so even before the pandemic, I was already sort of maybe an early adopter in, in the use of, of, of virtual care, but at least here in Ontario, and of course, across, we know this is the national webinar. And so this is going to be very different um, in different jurisdictions. But um, um, I was using Ontario telemedicine to provide some, some clinical care. Um, initially, it was really for people who live far away, but Increasingly, um, the province is recognizing that there are some some conditions that lend themselves well to what I would call high frequency, low touch care. So multiple frequent checkpoints, but not necessarily needing a you know like a full 30, 45 minute type of um, assessment with a large physical exam component. And I think that even before the pandemic, diabetes was was um, something that was ripe for that, especially when you couple it with diabetes technology. So for people who are lucky enough to have access to technology like continuous glucose monitors and the sharing platforms that come along with those continuous glucose monitors, you can have really positive interactions with your healthcare team without actually having to even do an email. But perhaps for some people, you're not comfortable with your data on the cloud or the pump doesn't download to the cloud system properly, but the CGM does. And even with a quick download at home and then an email of your pump printouts, um, you can really have useful interactions with your healthcare team without necessarily meeting in person. And so I like to kind of distinguish between virtual care and digital health a little bit. Um, and I, when I've been given the opportunity to speak about this, I do because I think virtual care is just care provided virtually. And ideally it's with a healthcare provider that you already have a nice established relationship with. Um, and, um, you know, maybe that relationship is something that, you know, some of the care is provided in person and some of the care is provided virtually. And in the, after the pandemic and the need for physical distancing is no longer the reason to provide care virtually, it should be sort of a, in, as much as possible, a choice for the patient. Is a patient, like Karen said, would prefer to come in person, then she can come in person. But maybe one time, it just doesn't make sense for her to come in person because of all of her competing demands with her young children and her work schedule, and then it can be done virtually. Obviously, if there's a clinical concern that comes up that needs physical assessment, then that can be you know, converted into a physical in-person appointment. But I hope the future is sort of a blended hybrid model that sort of has this digital health ecosystem around care. And so that includes the ability to do secure messaging or email with your care providers, as well as sharing data through the platforms that we've spoken about. And, um, um, and then, you know, having the right care at the right time for the right person. Um, and obviously that is gonna depend a lot on how the provincial governments decide to continue funding physician care after the pandemic. Um, every, every province has put in some form of temporary funding to support virtual care in the context of physical distancing. Um, we don't know what that's going to look like. And then, of course, I recognize um, that I'm very lucky because I happen to have a population of patients living with diabetes who are pretty technologically plugged in both maybe because my province gives good access, but in fact, we are one of the laggards when it comes to covering CGM. And there's been some great announcements for some other provinces in the last couple of weeks when it comes to covering Dexcom. But probably where I work in the city, I have patients who have good insurance and can afford to be on these advanced technologies. And so there's certainly other, other people living with diabetes and other diabetes care providers who are in awe with the fact that when I have a busy clinic, I think I mentioned this to Mark and Brooks, and Karen before, I have right now Dexcom, Diasend, Libre View, CareLink, 
uh, tide pool, all of those windows open on one desktop, on one computer screen, and then I've got my Zoom screen and my electronic medical record open. And that's how I conduct my busy day because I'm using all those different sharing platforms to provide care to my patients. Whereas lots of people are still having their patients read out their blood sugars, one blood sugar at a time, which is incredibly painful for everyone involved and doesn't really allow you to focus on what matters most to the patient. So those are just a few of my thoughts about what connected care can look like in the future for, for um, it when it comes to diabetes. Thanks, Lana. And I, I really like the, uh, the distinction you've, you've made between virtual care as a, a tool or a, a channel and digital health as a sort of ecosystem. It's almost the, the metaphor that pops into my head is uh, if virtual care is a set of, it's the trees, the uh, digital health is the whole forest and everything it lives in and how it interacts with one another. Um, I'm, I'm curious, I have a, a quick follow-up question. I, I was thinking, Karen, to your point, I was interested where you said you actually prefer these in-person in visits. And I'm, I'm sure there are folks like that. I'm wondering, um, maybe Alana and, and Karen, if, you're, if you'd like to talk a little bit about what's called white coat syndrome and what uh, digital health means for folks that might be hesitant to, to go in person and might um, you know, prefer this, this digital approach or the opposite, uh, someone a bit more in Karen's case that might really thrive on, on engaging face-to-face -face with a care provider. I think that um, I think that, like Alana said, offering a hybrid model could be really, really good because with white coat syndrome, we know that patients are going to come into the office and have their blood pressure checked, and it's going to be 160 on 110. And from a diabetes cardiovascular risk standpoint, that is not ideal blood pressure. But we know at home, the same patient's going to have a beautiful blood pressure of 120 on 80, and we we love that blood pressure. So I think that there's a good com there's a good like opportunity for a hybrid model where Maybe you have patients who are hypothetically checking their blood pressure at home, making sure that their blood pressure is under control, um, reducing those like long-term diabetic complications, but then being seen so that they can have their objective foot assessment, making sure that if they do have neuropathy, somebody is assessing them to make sure that they're at, not at risk for a diabetic foot ulcer and eventually potentially a foot amputation. Like, I think that there's a, a potential role for hybrid, like Alana was saying. I, I would just, I, I completely agree. I mean, I think we just need to put the patient at the center of these conversations a lot more. Um, and um, I think prior to the pandemic, there was a desire both from policymakers and uh, Canadians to see more virtual care. But what the pandemic forced us to do is see how well it could be done overnight. Um, and it would have taken years and years of like political conversations um, and we would have made a very small dent in it. One thing I'll, I'll also bring up, I think this is likely the case across all jurisdictions, but of course I'm most familiar with Ontario, is that virtual care can be provided on the phone. So a lot of people think about virtual care as being like what we're doing right now using you know video conferencing uh, platforms, but there's big equity issues when it comes to virtual care. And, um, and we, we wanna make sure that people can access care safely and effectively from a place that makes sense for them. And that's probably something that the pandemic really did show us is that both for patients and providers, I would say probably 80 plus percent of the virtual care that's been provided across Canada has been by phone, not by video. Um, and so again, that'll be something that we'll have to consider. Personally, especially when I'm meeting a new patient, I think video goes a long way um, to be able to sort of get those, those nonverbal cues and sort of, you know, have a, a face behind a voice. Um, but for well-established visits, patients that I already know well, it's so much easier and more convenient to just, you know, have a quick catch up on the phone while we're both looking at the Clarity um, website um, and we don't necessarily need that additional video piece. I think that there's a really important notion uh, in what's just been said and that's this concept of equity and uh, equitable access to these technologies, to these forms of care. And, I'd like to pass a bit of a impromptu question over to Mark, because Mark, I know you've been involved in a lot of uh, advocacy efforts in both in, in your home province in Newfoundland and Labrador, but across the country. And I think this, this notion of equitable access, when we talk about whether it's insulin pumps, whether it's uh, advanced glucose monitors, 
that really shows up jurisdiction to jurisdiction. You know, you and I are, uh, Mark, you and I are calling in from Atlantic Canada, which has no coverage for, let's say, CGM and limited coverage for pumps. Meanwhile, there are other jurisdictions that are um, essentially offering full coverage for both. So what's your take? It's a bit of a, a loaded question, but what's your take on this, this split that, that's happening between jurisdictions? And what's the, I guess, opportunity and challenge recognizing uh, this dissonance between provinces and territories right now? Thanks, Brooks. Yeah, I mean, you know, I could go on uh, on this question for for days, so I'll, I'll try and keep it short. But um, I think when it comes to the uh, so the advanced glucose monitor portion of the digital health component, um, they go very much hand in hand, um, as we've kind of touched on previously. Uh, in order to get the most out of a virtual appointment, um, having data and all your information and your blood sugars logged and just being able to pull that in a really nice report. Um, you don't get that same level of numbers through, uh, you know, finger pricks through the, the uh, traditional methods of, of glucose monitoring. And um, so what we find is, is um, you know, that, that life gets easier when you have these, uh, these advanced technologies. And um, not only does it get easier, but we've noticed that it's really much the, the literature supports this, um, you know, the anecdotal experiences of people living with it supports it that um that these technologies are just kind of worth their weight in gold you know as the, the saying goes an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of a cure um and we very much see this with with again continuous glucose monitors specifically and uh, flash glucose monitors as well um but the the coverage isn't isn't equal as you'd mentioned so um you know there's a couple provinces actually several provinces now who've got on board to fully support um, or fully provide cgms um, in terms of coverage and partial coverage and then in the atlantic provinces um well not just the atlantic provinces but in newfoundland where i'm living there there is no coverage and there's there's a lot more provinces like that as well and we know that um the those who get to access it and you know like myself at at that point in time when i didn't have that access it was kind of linked to me having a job and when i didn't have a job i couldn't access it and i you know had a uh, privilege of, of of going um coming from a family that could put me through a good school and that's why i was able to get that job but there's so many people out there that don't have that same opportunity so i was so fortunate that i was able to have that advanced um, care for years and years while others others don't um, but a big part of what we're trying to do with this advocacy initiative is just to raise awareness that not only is it just hugely helping people's quality of life, um, reducing the mental toll, the diabetes distress, as we previously talked about, but we're seeing that it's a win-win from a feasibility perspective on the healthcare system as well. Um, so uh, Brooks actually did have a fantastic presentation that did a cost budget uh, analysis on um, continuous glucose monitors and, and it doesn't take much to crunch the numbers to see that they're worth it, considering that if you go to hospital, uh, a single stay in, in hospital overnight is on average about 6000 to $6,200. And the price of a CGM for a full year is uh, about 3600 if you're looking at the Dexcom G6 um, and a little higher and lower depending on the systems that you're using. Um, but long story short, is there's many people who can't access this because of varying factors and it's it's not only not that it's not fair um but it's more so that that it, it just doesn't make sense from you know an entire uh, economy and in, in the feasibility aspect um there would be a lot more money saved if everybody had this and just you know overall uh well-being of of our residents and would be much better so um yeah, that's that's kind of the what we're advocating for is is for full coverage nationwide. Um, Brooks, you're heavily involved in the Diabetes 360 strategy, which touches into this as well. And there's a lot of, of a lot of great work going on. I highly recommend anybody who wants to get involved in advocacy to go check out uh, Type One Together, uh, the Facebook page. Um, that's where the true uh, advocates are. Not myself, but. Uh, you know, uh, John Whitehead, Jen Alexander, et cetera, they're, they're doing really good work on the advocacy perspective. Um, but in terms of, of virtual care to stay, stay on track here, um, yeah, again, the uh, virtual care very much favors those with access to the technology. And while it seems exciting and easy, um, you know, to talk about virtual care, 
it's just important to remember that it's much easier for those who have access to the technology um, and barriers still exist, right? So again, to touch on affordability of the devices, um, whether it's insulin pumps, CGMs, uh, coverage isn't the same across each province. Um, it varies from province to province. Some are doing much better than others. Um, so we know there's still a, a big opportunity to, to improve all that. Um, things like even like Wi-Fi and computer access is, is problems for some individuals in the community. And I'll come to an end here on this little rant, but um, it's important to just ensure that we have readily accessible technologies um, in order to successfully navigate uh, a virtual appointment. So, I completely agree with everything. I, I completely agree with everything Mark said. Um, I mean, I could not have said it better myself. And we just add insulin is still not readily um, accessible to everyone. And you know, I mean, I've certain CGMs have taught me more than ever before um, about the importance of sort of second generation basal insulins and the like. And we we don't we don't those are not universally available on formulary. And depending where you live in Canada, some people are still using quite antiquated insulins. Um, a lot of people think about it as being an American issue because the cost of insulin is so much higher in the US and Canada, but there's still major, major barriers for access to good insulins um, for many Canadians. So another area for us to include in our advocacy efforts when we think about equity and diabetes care. Yeah, that's a great point. I forgot about that. Sorry to cut you off, Brooks, but um, we're, we're seeing that as well a lot in the community here is uh, because the provincial plans cover certain insulins and not others, people don't get to use the insulins that work best for them. So Traceba is an example of long acting insulin that tends to work well with a lot of people, not, not everybody, but certain ones. And um, some, some people can't access that and therefore they're, they're suffering the consequences of, you know, struggling with their sugars a little bit more. So thanks for bringing that up. Mm -hmm. I'd like to quickly echo, you know, Mark calling out the, uh, not calling out the negative connotation, celebrating the, the wonderful advocacy work that's being done all across the country. And I mean, this, this call as well as an example of that, there's, there's a piece that's involved in policy change, but also having these conversations that raise awareness is super important. So yeah, shout out to, to everyone that is involved in advocacy. And for those that want to get involved further, uh, as Mark mentioned, Type 1 Together is a great resource, as well as Diabetes Canada has uh, regional and provincial pages uh, that, that encourage discussion and share resources as well. Um, you can check out our, our website, diabetes.ca, or send an email to advocacy at diabetes.ca. And, uh, you know, that's part of my team. And we'd be happy to, to set you up with some opportunities to make your voice heard and help make a difference. Um, there's a lot of wonderful work going on that's worth celebrating. So thanks, Mark. Um, and shout out to you as well, of course, uh, doing, doing wonderful things in Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, Thanks, Bruce. You know, I, I'd like to, before we open up for a, a question and answer period, I'd like to just sort of open up the floor to the three of you to, to share what your overall experience has been with, with virtual care for type 1 diabetes and, and what opportunities and challenges you see in the near or longer term future. Um, so for myself, I, my, uh, Virtual care for me kind of came to the forefront even before the pandemic when I was pregnant with um, my twin boys two years ago. And um, at the time, my wonderful, amazing endocrinologist, Dr. Halperin, was always available over um, email to kind of check it. I would just say to her, you know, I'm, my sugars are up again the last 24 hours. Can you pop on to Clarity and look and critique and let me know? And within an hour or two, I'd usually hear back from her with a little bit of feedback and some suggestions for how to manage my sugars a little bit better. So I think that um, there's a huge role for um, virtual care. And I think that it certainly has its place in, in helping us manage our chronic disease. Um, and I think even just as a patient with, you know, diabetes, you have to, you have to manage it on your own. It's, it's a it's, diabetes self-management is the hallmark of, of, um, you know, good long-term care. Um, and I think that the technology is out there and access, you know, if, if people can access it, um, and they want to talk about that technology and they have access to it and they want to learn more about it and want to talk to somebody with diabetes about it, I'd be happy to chat, but the technology is out there and, um, allows like you're, you're kind of on high alert all the time with the technology that's out there because you, you get 
push notifications about your blood sugars all the time and you don't necessarily love that because diabetes is 24 7 but um it's great technology and um and it really is a game changer for managing diabetes so if you can access it and, and you're not sure about uh you know it, it it's it's a foreign idea and you're not sure it's something that you want to embrace and you want somebody to chat about with it i'd be happy to talk because it's great um, but from a virtual care standpoint, I think it's here to stay. And I think that we just need to kind of find ways, being focused on the patient that works for the patient, but and the provider, um, in order to just like an, an overall enhance um, type one diabetic outcomes, because diabetes is tough. And um, yeah, that's what I'll say. Um, so I don't want everyone to think that their endo is no good because they don't respond to emails in two hours. <laughs> Karen is a special patient. She Karen was one of my very, very first patients, uh, and she actually followed me from where I was doing my training downtown Toronto up to Sunnybrook, and then tried to separate from me when she moved out to Guelph, and then came back to me when she got pregnant again. And now with virtual care, it's easy to keep in touch. So I, I think that um, one other thing I would mention is a follow up to what Karen said was that I recently had to put a standing. Uh, um, response on my emails because um, I just get too many and it can be hard to keep track. Um, and so if I could do it all over again, I wish that I had created a secure platform as opposed to email. I really like that I'm accessible to my patients all the time, but when I respond in real time, it doesn't always make its way to the chart. And I don't always have all of the information that I should have when I respond. Um, so I, I, I don't, um, you know, I, I do talk about that a lot as being part of that digital e ecosystem is a lot of physicians are now working with electronic medical records and there's a lot of different ways to do secure messaging, um, which can still even go to the physician's um, personal devices if the physician chooses to do that. Um, but I do think that, you know, part of, of good, good diabetes care, it can be asynchronous as Karen spoke to, it can be a lot easier for her to say, I've noticed this trend with my blood, my glucose after dinner for the last week. Can you pop onto Clarity? Here are my updated pump settings. And a, and a patient who makes it easy for the provider does that. Here are my pump settings. I'm noticing this trend. What do you think? Um, as opposed to just sort of saying, everything's high and I don't know what to do. And then I need to ask for so many different things. And, you know, I think it's like we're a partnership and I've used the term a lot to say, I see myself more and more and virtual care has brought this out for me as sort of a coach or a cheerleader for the person living with diabetes. I have developed a certain amount of expertise when it comes to looking at people's um, uh, CGM reports. Uh, whether they're flash or glucose monitoring, to me, interpreting the ambulatory glucose profile is an art that I now teach a lot of other people, just like we interpret an electrocardiogram. There's an art to interpreting an ambulatory glucose profile that involves engaging with the patient. So as opposed to an electrocardiogram where you may not have to ask the patient what happened when that happened, you need to have those conversations with patients. But sometimes it can be done asynchronously, which is more efficient for everybody. And so I do think that that's another area from a policy perspective that requires attention because those are not actually paid interactions almost anywhere in Canada. So that's just something we do because we care about our patients doing well. Um, but not every end is going to do that and I don't want everyone to walk away and expect that. Um, but I do love my job and I love being able to help people like Karen deliver beautiful babies into the world um, despite, you know, the challenges of living with diabetes. And so that's why I do it. That's really, I really appreciate that note of like, again, it's coming back to values of what does the patient, what can you allow a patient to do um, is a really, really wonderful lens to take on providing care. So kudos to you for that, Elena. Um, so folks, we're going to now open the floor to questions. Um, so I see one question that's been submitted through our Facebook chat and I'll, I'll start with this. And I think this is uh, a fairly broad question that also touches on policy change. And it's, uh, I'll open this up to the three of you. Uh, if you have an opinion or a thought, please feel free to share. And the question is, how can we educate schools better for children with type 1 diabetes? I'm just going to take it. I guess I'll try. So um, as an endocrinology trainee, we were um, have to do an advocacy project 
to learn about what it is to, to be an advocate and, and work in advocacy as one of the roles of physicians. Um, and certainly advocacy has been a huge thing for physicians during the pandemic, but even before that. So we, we try to work with, with actually with Diabetes Canada around preparing some some um, educational information for schools, but it is really hard because as I'm sure many of you who are joining in know that although this group who's right now together with us on Facebook Live, I, we were joking before that on this panel, I'm the only one who's not living with type one. And so I was the odd one out, but the reality is most kids go to school and they may be the only kid with diabetes. And it almost reminds me of a place where I'm much more comfortable than schools, to be honest, um, is the hospital. So the bulk of patients living with diabetes who make their way into the general medicine wards in the hospital have type two and type one is a different disease. And sometimes I wish it was named differently because the, the, the two can be conflated and then healthcare professionals who are not experts in type one. And I'm sure many of you living with type one can appreciate times where you've interacted with healthcare professionals who are not experts in type one. And you felt scared that your diabetes was being mismanaged while you were in hospital and felt like you could manage it better than the nurse or the doctor looking after you. And that is real because you can because they're not trained to understand type one diabetes. And so the same is true for schools. And so I think it's not easy to say that, you know, it needs to be part of education because they could learn it just like all of the doctors and nurses learned it during their training, but then they don't see it. So they don't use it. But I think there are Diabetes Canada has worked hard to provide and create tools and Brooks can probably speak to this that can be used so that if you're a parent in a community where you have a, a child at school and the school isn't comfortable or familiar with caring for a kid at school with diabetes, that you can use those toolkits to work with your school, your teacher, your principal. Because it's not easy to say that they should learn about diabetes during their training because they may, but then if they don't get exposed to it on a regular basis, they're not gonna be able to put that into action. For sure, again, CGM and, and, and the following uh, capabilities that glucose monitors provide is hugely beneficial, but it takes us back to that equity issue. I've certainly heard stories about times where, you know, the parent is calling the school because they can see that in half an hour, their kid is gonna be low before the kid or the teacher know that they're gonna be low. And then they're saying, bring my kid some juice. Um, and you know, that's hard. It's hard work for parents full-time job because you probably also have a full-time job. But I think in some ways the CGMs have definitely helped, um, but obviously we still have a long way to go in that space. I'm not sure if anyone else wants to add to that response. Yeah, just to, to piggyback on that, I completely agree with what you were saying there, Alana. And, you know, coming back to the, um, the kind of the win-win the component of CGMs in general, and the same thing goes with, with children. I think back when I was five, diagnosed with type one and running around and, you know, a couple of checks throughout the day, which I wasn't paying any attention to kind of thing, but um, was having a lot of lows those days. We'll, we'll leave it there. And, you know, if you have that kind of support system, um, whether it's uh, integrated into a school, um, you're really, yeah, it might be looked at as an extra expense to some of our policymakers, um, but the mishaps that you can avoid by having that support system, um, again, worth its weight in gold. And, uh, and it really just, you know, provides parents and, and children with that extra level of comfort and all around is uh, really a win-win for, for the system in general. So just wanted to touch on that. And I think if we just go back to basics in terms of school aged children and um, managing type one diabetes at school, I also was a child when I was diagnosed, I was 10. And um, I think a big thing, this is not necessarily speaking to policy changes, but I think as a parent or as a, as a child, um, just having a safety plan in place and having teachers and support staff at the school familiar with signs of hypoglycemia and what to do and having safety kits wherever those kids are um glucagon on hand fixed sugars when i was 10 i carried skittles everywhere because my pediatric endocrinologist told me that those are the fastest acting sugar i was happy to carry those around that was pretty cool <laughs> so having safety just having a, a bit of a safety net for kids in school um, and having teachers and support staff recognize signs of hypoglycemia is important. I would actually just follow up on that with one other thought, which is another thing that I think has made why type one is so close to my heart is I've had the privilege of working at Camp Huronda for the last, I guess, well, now we're the second summer of Camp Huronda, which is a Diabetes Canada funded camp here in Ontario that we're not running, but I worked there since I was an endocrine trainee, so at least eight years. And um, sometimes the parents would say to me, 
I hate what happens to my kids' sugars at camp. I do such a better job controlling the sugars at camp at home than you guys do at camp. But then I remind them that the key to camp was safety and for kids to have fun. And so sometimes, you know, glucose control can't be perfect in a classroom setting either, but to Karen's point, you know, safety comes first. And, um, and that's certainly the, the, the tactic that we take at camp is a lot for, again, the opposite of what these kids have experienced, being the only kid in their whole school with diabetes and suddenly they get to go to a camp where, um, you know, my kids are the odd ones out because they're one, some of the only campers at the camp who don't have diabetes. Uh, and it's, a, it's, a, it's important to put safety first and let kids be kids sometimes. I think that's really, really great point. And it's, it's not that it's about creating a perfect, pristine, polished environment. It's about harm reduction. So removing the chance of really negative outcomes. Um, and that's a, you know, it's always a great starting point in developing these safety systems. Um, so I'm not seeing any other questions coming in. So I'm going to I'll, I'll comment then when you talk about harm reduction, I'll bring up another thought, one other point, which is there's another time in, in patients' lives that I think is really important to talk about harm reduction. And that's actually the transition from pediatric to adult care, um, which is a real, a real um, passion of mine. And I, I've now had the very wonderful experience of having three or four I think I might be up to five sort of Huronda campers graduate into my care. So they were in pediatric programs and I was their camp doc and now I'm just their doc. Um, and um, one of the things I always start off with and I say to the parents at the first visit is emerging adulthood and emerging um, is just really hard. You know, think about emerging adulthood in the context of the pandemic, even more magnified in terms of all of the pressures associated with the social isolation, um, maybe moving away from home for the first time. And then you layer on like kind of becoming an independent person living with diabetes and it's that much more challenging. And so I am not too concerned about A1Cs in those years. The, to me, it's about establishing a rapport and making patients know that this is my office, is a safe and non-judgmental place. And the key is to keep safety, keep you out of hospital. I I don't want severe hypoglycemia, I don't want DKA. And we talk really about all of the things that happen in young adulthood in terms of drinking and drugs and all of that stuff. And it's important to be able to have those conversations with, with your diabetes team. And so for if there's parents listening today or young adults listening today, I think that that's just an important message as well is that the diabetes isn't going away. And of course, you know, A1C as a, as a long-term preventative measure is important, um, but you know, it's about both the acute and long-term complications and that um, you know, if patients feel like they're coming to the principal's office to be judged on what their A1C is, then their parents stop telling them they have to go, they may just stop showing up. And then those are the people who really end up becoming a burden on our healthcare system 15 years later to Mark's point, uh, when they start to experience all those diabetes complications. And now that I've had been at this job, I've actually been able to see many patients under my care mature from sort of not really caring about their diabetes to really caring about their diabetes um, and getting through that challenging time of young adulthood, emerging into adulthood. Fantastic. Thank you, Elena, for, for sharing that. Um, we're, we're coming to the end of our time together, which this has been a fantastic conversation. And before we close off, does anyone else um, have any final remarks that you'd like to share with our viewers or something you wish you, uh, a piece of information you wish you could share? Um, I just wanted to note on earlier too, uh, I did mention the advocacy side of things, but I did miss a lot of work as, as you uh, kind of uh, piggybacked on there. Um, there's so much wonderful advocacy work going on right now. I know Quebec just had a really good announcement in terms of the advocacy funding as well. And uh, uh, Diet Kids had a big portion in that. So uh, lots of gratitude to go around with, with the wonderful advocacy work going on across the country. And I, I apologize if I left anybody out. Karen, any final remarks? I'd also like to give a shout out to, this is probably the best webinar that's ever uh, been, been pro provided to from inside a minivan. Uh, I don't, don't know if it's happened elsewhere. Karen's power is out, so she's uh, gone mobile. <laughs> yeah, guys, the minivan, my, my husband calls this our um, van Burgini. So that's what I'm driving today. <laughs> um, but final thoughts, um, I think virtual care is here to stay. I think that's okay, but I don't think we all have, to, I think we have to be kind of comfortable with uncomfortable uh, scenarios here. We might not be necessarily comfortable with providing and receiving virtual care, um, 
but I think it's going to be here to stay. And that's not a bad thing. I think we just have to kind of all figure out together with um, us diabetics being the center of it all, what's best for us. Yeah, and just on that, I, I really hope it is here to stay. Um, you know, I think, you know, to your point earlier, Karen, I really do enjoy the face-to-face -face interactions with the, the diabetes teams. Um, but then I have those bad days where I just don't want to go into the clinic and I'd rather, you know, do it from home. So really um, touching on Alana's idea of the hybrid model, um, you know, giving the, the patient-centered um, voice as well as the uh, provider is, is super important. So um, yeah, I think overall moving forward, I, I really hope that it continues down this path. So. Yeah, in, in summary, I think it's here to stay and we can all play a part in making sure that happens. Um, I'd like to thank you so much, our, our three guests, Mark, Karen, Elena. Uh, I really appreciated this conversation and I hope that our viewers did as well. And for those that, that view this in the future, I'm sure they'll, they'll glean something from it too. So to our viewers, uh, please never hesitate to reach out to us. You can reach Diabetes Canada via email at info at diabetes.ca on the phone at 1-800-BANTING, or uh, you can find an answer, hopefully, to your question at diabetes.ca. Uh, we hope this webinar has been really helpful for you. I know I learned from this and, and I'm leaving feeling a lot better and more knowledgeable about this topic. And uh, I think hopeful and, and grateful are the, the, the key feelings, which is uh, really important to celebrate those moments living with type one when we can uh, find a bit of hope for what's coming next. So I'm, I'm excited about this, this topic. Thank you all and uh, take care of yourselves. Be well. Thanks so much.